in the quest of becoming the best version of me, nothing has made a bigger difference than biking. Biking has become my zen, my health. It makes me want to be better, but it also shows me a lot about respect and finding your own limits. In a job like mine where you get rejected 99% of the time, you need to have some kind of outlet. And I discover in biking something that I enjoy more than acting. Joining us in the studio today is a Colombian film and TV star. He's an actor, producer, and director, best known internationally for his role as Gustavo Gavaria in the Netflix series Narcos. He's a cycling ambassador, husband, father, and thrill seeker. Please welcome Juan Pablo Raba. Hey, hey. So Man. good to see you. Man, you're good at this. You're actually good at this. Like this intro thing, you, you have this down, brother. I could, <laughs> I, could, I could use you in a couple, like, can I use this? Anytime, anytime. You, you free, free rights, brother. Are you blushing a little bit from that intro? Um, I am, but you can't see it because I can act to not be blushed. Oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot you're an actor. I think of you as a cyclist first and an actor second. I love that. Actually, I, I think that's pretty cool because I think I'm, um, I have worked hard for that to earn that space in the cycling community. So it's actually really cool. And I have, you know, I have a huge following, of course, because of my projects. But it's been yeah. really, really interesting to see how over the years I have created this whole biking community around, around, around my, the things I love about biking. Well, JP, it's a super special treat to have you uh, joining the show. Thank you so much. I know you know you and I have stayed in touch through the years, and it's cool to see your 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 love for the bike, and that's of course how we got connected. Um, but it's cool to have a big big time movie star on the show and uh, sharing your story. So thanks. No, absolutely. I don't, I don't know if I'm a big movie star, but you know I'll, I'll get there. Ah, <laughs> uh, come on, you're the, you're there. You're there in my book. Um, <laughs> Let's start with some of the basics. So for the people that are listening in or watching on YouTube that don't know you or your story, we're going to start with the basics. So where were you born? So I was born in Bogota, Colombia, from an Argentinian father and a Colombian mother who got married after 10 days what? after they met on an airplane. Whoa. So there you go. Speed wedding. Wow. I would love to say that it was a huge love story and they're still together, you know, but it actually went south pretty fast. <laughs> um, and so during that going south part of the story, my dad moved to Spain and I moved to Spain with him. And then I lived in Spain for 10 years. So my teenage years were spent in Spain, actually. Did you travel between Colombia and Spain or? For 10 years, for, for 10 years, I didn't come back to Colombia. Wow. Let's stay in your childhood, sort of that, that first 10 years of your life. Yeah. Um, what'd you do to stay out of trouble or did you get in trouble? I wasn't, I wasn't too much of a trouble, of a trouble kid. Um, I was a good student. The funny thing is that it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't really hard to be a good student. Like it was enough with paying attention. I, yeah. I kind of, I kind of really understood very, really fast that the the best way of not getting in trouble was having good grades, you know, and and having the teachers kind of, you know, like you, so yeah. to speak. So I, I, I think I was, I was, I was a socially intelligent in in the class, right? I was, I was not a brat, but I was not, I was not a saint. Um, but I. I was passionate about skateboarding, martial arts, and at some point, no, at that point, actually not martial arts. I'm going to scratch that. That, that. that came after. It was more skateboarding when I was a kid. Skateboarding, man. Yeah. Um, was skateboarding big in Spain back then? No, that was in Colombia, by the way. We're talking about those first 10 years that was in Colombia. Yeah, yeah. I went to an American school as a kid, so I, I got, I was really close with American culture. Okay. So as a kid, like, you know, um, Tony Hawk and uh, Brutus the Barber Beefcake from WWF were like my <laughs> idols. Um, I already knew about SNL. I heard rock. Like, that was my music, right? My music was um, Motley Crue and, and Bon Jovi oh, yeah. and Iron Maiden, right? So I, 
I was living in Colombia, but the school was so American. I joke about my school. It's called the CNG. Actually, in Spanish, it's Colegio Nueva Granada. But it says, everybody says it's the CNG. And I joke about it because I say it's more American than American schools. So I was, I, I, as a kid, that was, that was like what I looked up to, right? Like spending yeah. my summers in Miami and just visiting the States as much as possible. And um, so skateboarding was not big here, but it was, it was for me because, you know, I already had like skate magazine, all that stuff. And just watching these guys shred. Yeah. yeah. Were you ever into bikes or was it pure skateboard? It was, I was into bikes, but just as a social means of transport transportation. Yeah. Yeah. It was never, I was never a BMX guy. I wish I was a BMX guy. You know, I would be so much better. So much, I would be such a better rider today. <laughs> but I never, I, it kind of never grew into me. It was just, you know, I could grab my bike and go to my buddy's house. That was, that was it. Yeah. I didn't know anything else about it. When you were a kid, what did you want to do when you were um, older as a profession? So I remember that my first dream about becoming a professional was about being an astronaut. That kind of then drifted into, okay, to be an astronaut, you have to be a pilot, right? So uh, then, of course, I was dreaming about being in Top Gun. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to, I wanted to be that guy. But then, of course, I was not American, so it was not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. There was no chance of being... Did you want to be Maverick or Iceman? Oh, no. I wanted to be Maverick, for sure. Iceman was too serious. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then that kind of you know took me into, for a number of years maybe wanted to become a commercial airline pilot, you know, but I guess my first love was kind of up there. Also, when I was a kid, my mom, um, she was a flight attendant and uh, her second husband was an airplane, an airplane uh, pilot. So mm -hmm. kind of planes were, were kind of, you know, close to us. The funny thing is that there was also a love for cars. That came after my 10 years. And I'll tell you a, a little bit about that later on. So you went to an American school, super cool, um, or or you went to an international school, right? And you were exposed to a bunch of different cultures. But did you like idolize America? Did you think, gosh, one day I want to live in America? Absolutely. A hundred percent. My wife jokes jokes with me and says that whenever we're in the States, she says like, you have always belonged here. Like you understand more about um, about the U.S. than about Colombia in many in many ways. Like I feel I've always felt very comfortable around Americans and American culture. Well, I mean, your language, your language skills, your your accent is so like almost perfect. Like I I can barely detect it when you speak English. Yeah, it's 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 funny, man. It's funny because um. <laughs> It's a, it's actually been been difficult for me because sometimes because it's good or that good, some producers and casting directors in the U.S. have trouble kind of putting me into the box, right? Because they want me to play the Latino role. They kind of talks English like that because he's yeah, Latino, yeah. <laughs> right? All right, let's get let's get through school. So you're you're a pretty good student. You're into sports and athletics. Yeah. Um, you ultimately graduate high school and what did you study sort of professionally in that next chapter and, you know, college or university? Well, the thing is that at 10 years old, something, something happens is that my, my, my parents got divorced when I was seven. We were yeah. living in Madrid at that time. Then I came to Colombia from seven to 10. And then at 10 is when I go back and live with my dad and I don't live with my mom anymore. So I, I start living with my dad. And when I, when I get to Spain, my dad, when he was younger, he was a, he was a race car driver mm. and he knew a lot about engines, you know, and motors. So then my life becomes also very involved with, um, car restorations, um, with motorcycles, you know, we changed oils and we did our own mechanics in the garage. So I start learning about, you know, using tools. I start getting really handy. And, and learning a lot about, you know, electronics. And then my life becomes a little bit more like, I don't know how to say it, but very hands-on, you know, like my dad was, oh, you want this? Okay, you're gonna work for this. 
You know, you have to wake up, you have to do shit, you have to take care of a bunch of stuff. So yeah. then my interest kind of, kind of, kind of drift towards that. Uh, at some point, even it, it, I may have had the chance to, you know, start like a driving career in carts. Yeah. But the reality was my dad was going through a very, very hard, you know, financial time. So there was really no money to support that. So at that moment in my life, I went into soccer. I became a, 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 a goalkeeper and I became really good at it. And then at 16, I got, I, ha- I got injured. I had like a quadruple injury on my knees. Oh, I stopped doing that for a year. I stopped doing any kind of sports for a year and then got into martial arts and became really good at Taekwondo. Um, then when I was getting really good at Taekwondo, and was going to start in competitions, I moved back to Colombia, <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> Looks like a pretty strong thread of, you know, excellence and competition in your blood, right? You know- Is that so? N- no, I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that, Dave. I, for me, it's, it's more about becoming good at something. It's never been about competing with others. For me, it's always been about competing with myself. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't really find it. I've never been thrilled about uh, contests or competitions. What I've always wanted to do is I want to become good at whatever it is I do. Yeah. That doesn't mean I have to become a champion. That doesn't mean I have to beat someone else. But I really like to feel comfortable you know, getting to a level where I feel comfortable. Like at some point I was, I was considering starting to uh, race uh, motocross. Right. Yeah. And so I, and so I, you know, I, I got a bike and started practicing and I was good, but I never felt the urge to actually be so good that I could compete or win something. There's something about my personality where I enjoy playing but I really don't have that super thrive to, oh my God, I have to win. And if I don't win, I, I go crazy. Like it's never, it's never, it's never been really, really on, on my, as you say, like my blood. When you talk about excellence, it's a personal thing for me. I don't like to compare yeah. myself to others. I like to be very conscious about my own limits and what I can achieve, you know, with my own capabilities. And that, makes me feel really happy when I know, you know, that I am pushing my own limit. I love that. Do you think that some of that comes from your parents, you know, were those values of either your mom or dad, did they never pushed you for competition or did you, do you have siblings growing up? Were you, you know, pushed by them? I have a bunch of like, you know, from my dad's side, from my mom's side. With my dad, it was always more about, he was always, listen, dude, I don't, I don't care what you do in life. I will tell you that it's up to you. Like you are not, I'm not going to leave you any money. So whatever I do (laughs) is for me, whatever you do. And and, and he was, and he was spot on. If for example, my first car, he told me I'll pay for half of your car, but you have to find the other, the other half. Yeah. It was always about, it was always about you are on your own. Like that was the philosophy in my house. It's like, you're born, you're born alone. You die alone, buddy. So you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna have to man the f up, yeah. You know, but it was not in a it was not in a in a cruel, manly kind of way. It was like in a this is the world, buddy, and this right. is what, and this is what you have to do to survive, right? So my dad was always about, like I don't I don't care about your grades. Like school is just, you know, part of the system. Just make sure to pass so you don't you don't close, you know, doors and opportunities for yourself. Yeah. And all he ever asked was, listen, if you're going to be a a window cleaner, cleaner, just be the best window cleaner that you can be. So it was cool because I think he took a lot of pressure off. You know, he never expected me to be as good in engines as he was, right? Like he was, he was a genius, right? Like he could put apart a car in one day and then put it back again together in one day. Wow. Um, but he was never expecting me to be like him. 
Yeah. He was always like, you know, you have to find your own path. You need to discover what your way will be. You know, at some point, some points it was scary growing up because I was like, well, what does that mean? Right. But, you know, <laughs> you know how life goes and, and you do start, you know, discovering shit on your own. So yeah. uh, I guess it's maybe that about why I didn't kind of get into competitions and stuff. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, um, I'll, I'll, I'll parallel a similar story with my kids. You know, we told our kids in school, bees are better. Okay. Like all you got to do is get a bee or better. Interesting. You know, we didn't say, we didn't say you better get straight A's or you're not going to go anywhere. Yeah. But we did set a bar, yeah. but we didn't set the, hey, you just got to pass. Yeah. We're like, you got to do a little bit better than passing, but we didn't want to give them so much pressure that they had to get A's. We just said, look, just get B's or better. Yeah. For me, it's like, I always tell my kid, like, listen, I'm, I will never want you because first of all, as a parent, you know, you wanting something about your kids is like, then you realize, you know, that has nothing to do with, with reality. But yeah. also like whenever he comes home, like with a bad grade or something like that, I, the only thing I ask him, you know, did you make your best effort? And it's great, you know, cause he looks at me and says like, nah, like, well, it's up to you, buddy. You know, I think you have right. to kind of start giving them that responsibility. That's kind of what my dad did to me, uh, which I'm not saying it's a successful experiment. I have, I can't, I can't, you know, vouch for that. But I think it's a cool way to take pressure and and let people find what they want in life. So you're 16 or so. Take us from take us from 16 to 20. What happens in that? in the, those four years, you know, getting through high school and into university and what was that path? It was, it was a little hard because at that point I was, I had a little also, I've always had like a little military tendency in me. I've had family in the military in Colombia. So at some point, you know, between the, uh, the thing that I told you about the Top Gun, the aviation, I started yeah. kind of getting interest, interested in, in, in maybe you know, a military career. And the thing is, because I was living in Spain and I was not a, I was not born in Spain. I really didn't have access to any of that. Right. So I have a couple of years where I really don't know what, what I want to do. I fly to Colombia because my uncle at the time, he was, uh, he was the commander for the submarine, the submarine division of the Colombian Navy. I was like, okay, maybe this could be, you know, a career. I was like 18. Um, I've been doing martial arts. I was in great shape. So I'm like, okay, this could be, this could be fun. And then I get to Colombia and for two weeks I go to Cartagena where that's where the base is. And I just party straight for two weeks. <laughs> straight. And my uncle says like, listen, buddy, I don't think the military life is cut for you. You're having a great time. <laughs> I don't, you know, like this is, this is not going to work. Yeah. So at that time I was taking a sabbatical because I really didn't know what to study. And I, uh, I kind of get a little bit into um, modeling just because a couple of friends were doing it. I'm like, well, this seems like something I could do, you know, to earn a couple bucks. <laughs> so I do it for a couple, uh, you know, a couple months and then I get bored. You know, I realize it's nothing that I would really be interested in. Yeah. And I go back to Spain and then I finish school and I get into advertising. I start studying advertising because I like I like I like the creative part of advertising. Right. So I start getting right. into advertising. I was working in bars, so it started getting a little bit rough because I would I had to work <laughs> Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So basically I had three days a week where I was a wreck because I I, I went to bed so late. I just right. couldn't keep up, you know, with my studies. So I, I, I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to find, find another job. So I found a job selling cars. And when I had, when I was ready at three days working there and I was ready to make my first sale, the manager broke my heart. He came to me and said, Juan, we all like you very much here, but we cannot hire you officially because you're on a student visa. You don't have a working visa. Uh. I'm like, what? And that was a breakthrough moment. You know, that's when I really understood that it was going to be hard for me to accomplish a lot of things that I wanted to do in Spain because I was not really from there. 
Right. Times have changed a lot now, right? So now it's it's right. easier probably, but then it would back then it was just it was complicated. So right. I have like this crisis, you know, like what am I going to do? What am I going to do? How old are you then? Then I'm uh, 19, 19, 20 okay. is getting to my 20s. So my dad tells me, "Why don't you go to Argentina to spend time with my family?" You know, and then in Argentina, which has amazing advertising, you can continue with your yeah. studies. And I said, you know what? Yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> so there I go. I land in Argentina. It was summertime and I was ready, you know, to kind of start, you know, doing all the process, you know, to get into um, into advertising there. You're living with your aunts and uncles or something? I'm living with my aunts and uncles in Buenos Aires, which are also my grand, my godparents. And they're amazing. Oh, yeah. But they all have older children. So it was me with them in the house and it just felt kind of weird. I was a, I liked to party back then too. So I I could see that it was not their ideal situation. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're like, oh my God, we just got this, you know, man or, or wannabe man come to our house, <laughs> definitely go out, you know, and and be partying. So I could feel they're, they're just, they were not comfortable. And then my mom, yeah. who is a character, calls me and says, you know what, what are you doing in Argentina? Why don't you come to Colombia? I will pay for half of your tuition and you can study to be an airline pilot. Whoa. I'm like, that sounds like a plan. <laughs> so I called my dad, said, hey, hey. Um, so my mom just called me and she told me to go to Colombia and she will pay for half the tuition for the airline thing. And he was like, listen, buddy, your mom does not have that money. <laughs> <laughs> if you go back to Columbia, you're going to be wasting your time. So no, the answer is no. I'm like, why are you saying that? I cannot believe it. I'm sure she has the money. I am leaving. And he was like, man, don't go. You know, you're in Argentina. I want you, you know, to live that Argentina life. That family, I'm like, no, forget about it. I'm going to Colombia. I went to Colombia and he was right. My mom did not have that money. Oh, man. So suddenly I'm in Colombia. I'm 20. My mom puts me to live with her ex, second ex-husband, oh, who, was the, who was the airline guy. So I'm stuck in Bogota. I have no idea what to do in life. I have no idea. And so this guy, his name is Harvey. He lives in Texas right now. And I love him to death. He says, how about we do this? I talked to the airline. Um, to see if they will admit you to the uh, to become a flight attendant. So that puts you in the company. That puts you making money. So that then you study. You know that and then you save money. You go. Yep. You know you take your you, you you go to flight school and then you become an airline pilot. I'm like that's a plan, dude. <laughs> there you go. So I have my interview with those guys. And cool. Okay. There I am. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Month goes by, two months go by, nothing happens. I am broke because oh. all the money I had, by the way, all the money I had from working in Spain, I I spend it on um on a Kawasaki Ninja. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> so I was broke. I had a green Kawasaki Ninja. Uh, I had no idea what to do in my life. Um, and then. I start like seeing a girl, not dating, just kind of seeing her. I'm with her in her house one day and, you know, trying to get lucky. And suddenly she just, you know, kind of, oh my God, uh, what time is it? Uh, I have to go to acting class. I'm like, what do you mean we have to go to acting class? We have something here. Like, no, I have to go to yeah. acting class. She's like, come with me. I'm like, really? Oh, okay, let's go. We go to acting class. So there I am, like just, you know, watching her do her thing. She had to prepare an audition for, an, for a Spanish film. So there I am, you know, and she was doing a scene with, a, with, a, with another actor. The other actor tells the, 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 the teacher, the acting teacher, I, got, I have to go. I have to go shoot. He goes, acting teacher looks at me and says, yo, like, yes, like, I need your help. Like, listen, dude, I have no clue. You stand in. And he was like, dude, don't worry. I'm not, I'm not going to be, it's not about you. It's about her. I just need you to read this lines so I can be looking at her. Because if I'm reading the lines, I can't be on her. Oh, yeah. Okay, I can do that. 
that moment, I remember having my first real actor thought. I remember looking at the script and saying, well, I guess if I do this correctly, if I really put an effort, it's going to help her. So that's what I do. I focus. I try my best. And when we finished the scene, the guy was actually looking at me more than looking at her. <laughs> and he's like, so you've never done this before. I'm like, no, I have never done it. It's like, okay, okay. So she finishes the class and he calls me apart and says like, listen, buddy, I think you have the talent for this, but I would need to audition you to see if it's really, you know, if you're really cut out for something like this. Yeah. I'm yeah, like, yeah, yeah. listen, I, I really appreciate it. I love film. I've always loved film, but I don't think this is, this is my deal, but thank you so much. Okay. He says, give me his card. Give me a call if you change your mind. So another month goes by, another month goes by. Now I'm, now I'm really broke. And I just called him one day and said like, you know, a couple of those buddies from my 18 year old trip that were modeling, they had become yeah. actors and they were doing pretty good. So at some point I was so broke that all I thought was if I get any kind of job, I'll just buy a ticket and go back to Spain and tell my dad what an idiot I am and do whatever he tells me. <laughs> were you still with the girl? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. Different girl. Different. Yeah. I, I, I didn't have anything. I mean, I was like, I was, I was, I wasn't even with myself, you know, I, was, I had no yeah, clue. Yeah. So one day, you know, a couple of my buddies tell me like, dude, why don't you, you know, go to get some classes, you know, and maybe you can get an acting gig and that will put you through your next. I'm like, yeah, whatever. So finally I call the guy like, hello, you know, teacher, professor, um, this is JP. But he's like, who? Like, well, this guy, you know, who, oh, yeah, yeah. How you doing? You know, he's kind of pissed because he was yeah. the teacher, right? And he's like, well, I was thinking, you know, maybe I can go and have that audition you mentioned. He was like, yeah, yeah, come in two weeks. You know, okay. I had to, you know, I like, I remember yeah, like, yeah, a five, like 5 a.m. morning, wake up. I had to take two buses. I didn't have the, the motorcycle anymore. So it was like <laughs> on the buses, you know, going there. I remember getting there. We start doing these exercises, right? And it's like, okay, so you're a horse now, right? I'm like, doing a horse. I'm like, what the fuck? Like, this is so dumb. I remember thinking all the audition, this is so dumb. What am I doing here? Yeah. I was like, I knew it. I just thought I knew it. Then we're about to finish. And he says, okay, I have one more exercise for you. I'm like, okay, go ahead. He's like, we're going to do like a sense memory exercise. I'm like, dude, whatever. You know, yeah. whatever. And then he's like, um, uh, okay, so now I want you to imagine something. You're going to, you're going to, uh, you're going to, to imagine this story. You are, you are a petrol, you know, you work in, 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 in oil, in the oil industry. You're a very successful engineer. You have married your high school sweetheart and you guys have a kid, a baby. So your life is perfect, uh, happy as a clam. And, oh, sorry. <laughs> this is the other, by the way. Um, you're happy, happy as a clam. Uh, and I am a, um, I'm a, a guerrilla fighter, and we kidnap your baby. And even though you paid ransom for your baby, we still killed him. And I'm there just standing like, what the hell is this guy talking about? And then he says, so now, now the police have caught me. And you have 30 seconds to tell me whatever you want. You cannot touch me because there's a glass between us, but you can tell me whatever you want. Go. Oh. And I just looked at this guy and starting, started trying to think everything I was going to say. And as I was doing that, I couldn't say anything. And I just started clenching my fists really, really hard. And I started crying. You see, I get emotional. That's pretty good. And this guy looks at me and says, that is acting. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Blew my mind. I could not believe what had just happened. Yeah. So it was so powerful. I got home 
And just for the next week, I was just trying to understand what was going on. And of course, I decided I wanted to, I wanted to start studying acting. And of course, two weeks after that, they called me from the airline to tell me that, you know, that I had a spot in the in the in the flight attendant thing. Of course. I'm like, sorry course. guys, I'm gonna be an actor. And I, <laughs> and I can listen on the phone, like, you know, the little kind of I was like, okay, buddy. And my my stepdad goes like, what's what what is this? What what are what do you mean you're gonna be an actor? Like, I, yeah, I'm gonna be an actor. It's like, but what the hell, Juan? I'm like, dude, I'm sorry. I just this just happened. And then like three weeks later, my dad calls and said, like, listen, buddy, you know, I'm sorry I've been so rough on you, but you've been pretty persistent with this shit. So I'm gonna give you the money, the whole, the whole tuition so you can become a pilot. I'm sorry, dad, I'm gonna become oh. I'm gonna be an actor. It's like, you're gonna be what? Like, I'm gonna be an actor. It's like, but how are you gonna make a living? I'm gonna act. <laughs> yeah. He hung up the phone and, oh, and that was it. That's how I started acting. And that was, uh, I was 21, 21, 22. Yeah. And how soon after that did you move to the States and, you know, pursue more classes and sort of on ramp to your, your acting career? So I started acting then, um, first year was, was bad. The second year was bad. Then the third year, I started getting a little bit of traction. I got an audition for a show in Venezuela, like a novella in Venezuela, and it become a big success. So I started working in Venezuela, right? Like I start, you know, like, oh my, you know, I, you can make a living out of this. And yeah. in my third year in Venezuela, I went to Strasbourg in New York and did a pretty, pretty intensive course of nine months in New York, which was really, really cool and made me think, okay, you know, novellas are cool and, you know, I can make a living, but I would definitely like to pursue something different. Yeah. I, I thought about maybe staying in the States at that moment, but I had a contract in Venezuela, so I had to go back to Venezuela. Then I got married in Venezuela for the first time. Uh, and then kind of, you know, the, the, the Hollywood dream kind of drifted away a little bit. And then when I was 30 years old, I was divorced. And that's when I really started pursuing kind of you know, the possibility of, of becoming an actor in the United States. Did you then move back to the United States from Venezuela after you got divorced? No, I got divorced. I went to Colombia and a couple of years later, I met Monica, my wife, who's American. She's raised in Colombia, but she's American. And after we got pregnant with our first kid with Joaquin, we just had a conversation and thought and said and decided that we wanted to give the U.S. you know a try, yeah. So we first landed in um, in Miami, and by the way, and there is where my biking life also starts. Yeah, my biking life starts right when my wife gets pregnant. I start looking for ways. I wanted to become the perfect dad. I wanted my kid. I started getting like really, really into. I'm going to create a perfect human being. <laughs> <laughs> so I start reading all the books. Like how to be a great dad, yeah. How to be a great dad, how to, how to have a great kid, everything. So I start getting into yoga and really start getting into spiritual things, right? And biking started becoming that for me. You know, in the beginning, I just bought a $300 bike with my, my buddies. I, I was doing CrossFit, but it didn't feel like it was really a spiritual, you know, search. So my best friend, who's an architect, you know, he was always telling me, you know, you should come bike with us. It's really cool. I was like, eh. finally, I got injured doing CrossFit. And, you know, I'm like, okay, you know what? I'll go bike with you. And kind of the same thing that with not, not like this, but I, the funny thing is that my wife noticed first that I did how beneficial it was. Yeah. She started telling me, dude, every time you come back from biking, you're a different human being. What kind of biking were you doing? Were you just road biking on the bike path or were you mountain biking on trails? I was mountain biking on a $300 bike on just, you know, uh, road, in Miami. Unpaved roads. That was, that was in Colombia. That was right before moving. Okay. Miami was my first serious bike, but it all started there. So I'm like, okay, this is kind of cool. And I started even calling it the bike therapy. And then I started really paying attention. And then what I, what I realized that happened is that it's just a bunch of dudes 
And we started talking. And because of the nature of biking, especially climbing and how hard it is, you start kind of, you know, you start losing that armor. Right. And so you really start talking about problems and shit that goes on with you. And when you're at the top of the mountain, everybody's like a little kid. Because everybody's so beaten up and so tired that you just kind of start talking. And I'm like, wow, this is really cool. And I started calling the bike therapy. And then we moved to Miami. And that's when I got my first real bike. Do you remember what bike it was? Absolutely. It was a 2012 Specialized Stump Jumper. 29er was my oh, yeah. 29er. It was an alloy bike. It was gray. And that's how I got, uh, got really, really hooked into it. So you're living in the States, you're getting into mountain biking, bike becomes your, your, your outlet, your therapy, um, which is cool. We hear, we hear that occasionally that, you know, that's why a bike because of the freedom and because of, you know, what it gives me emotionally and physically and mentally. Um, what was next, you know, when, when would you say, let's, let's talk about two things. When would you say, you got super into cycling mm -hmm. and when did you get sort of, when did your career as an actor sort of start to accelerate? Well, it kind of happened, it kind of, kind of happened at the same time. So I start getting into cycling, you know, my kid is born and I start, you know, find the benefits. There's a little, there's a couple in Miami mountain bike parks. Yeah. One is called Virginia Key and it's actually pretty cool. And it develops a very interesting set of skills because if you want to keep the flow, you have to pedal a lot. So it builds up, you know, your physique, you know, you start getting in great shape, but you also start building, you know, sort of confidence because you have, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a difficult terrain. Yeah. So I start falling a lot. Like I was just bruised and scarred all over, <laughs> but I couldn't stop doing it. Right. So then something happens. I get to Miami and one of these like, like novelas, Latino networks offers me, you know, um, a contract. They want me to be exclusive for them for the next three, four years. It was very good money. And, you know, and it was like, wow, this is the, this is an opportunity, you know, to buy a house and to really settle in the States. And I just had a kid. Yeah. And then, you know, I tell my wife, like, listen, I know this is very, very, um, appealing, but this is not the reason we came to the States for. It's like, we came here because we want to have a chance of, to do another type of projects. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't have anything uh, uh, against novellas. They gave me a great set of tools in what I do now. But I told her, if we want to do novellas, we should go back to Colombia because that's where the best ones are being done. So right. why, why are we here, right? It kind of defies the purpose. And my wife, being my wife, says, okay, I trust you. So we kind of took that, you know, plunge. And then three, three months after that, um, oh, sorry, sorry, I skipped the part. Right before that, right before that offer, I, I took a job that was being shot between, between Venezuela and Miami. That's, that's the moment we, that we said with my wife, okay, this is where we're going to go and set base in Miami, right? While I was shooting that, um, I took my specialized stump jumper to Venezuela. And one day a random guy in the street, I told him like, Hey, I, I just, I have a double suspension bike. Can I go ride with you? And he says, but can you ride in enduro trails? I'm like, uh, yeah, I mean, I ride all the time in Miami. Like, what is it? I mean, what is an enduro trail? Yeah. He looked at me and said like, okay, okay. I'll give you a call. Couple of weeks pass. This guy doesn't call me. I'm like, dude, what a what a dick. Like, I mean, why wouldn't he take me to riding? One day he calls me and yeah. says, "Okay, dude, we're going to this place called San Luis. It's a little enduro trail. Are you going to be okay?" I'm like, "Hell yeah, dude!" I almost died like ten times. <laughs> Literally, I I had no clue what I was getting into. Yeah, but for some reason, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And so while I was in Venezuela, my, 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 my kid was a baby. So I spent a lot of time by myself. So I would wake up like 4.30 a.m., 5 a.m. and just go and practice and practice on the trails. Hmm. I started doing research and then I got my first real enduro bike. And then I decided that the Stumpy was not 
you know, the bike for the job because actually the geometry sucked. So and then I got the, the first Bronson, the yellow one. And that's yeah. when I really said, okay, that's when I spent that money. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm screwed now. This is, this is it. This is, I'm done. Because I could never imagine yeah. that you could spend that money on a bike, right? So I got that bike and that's what completely changed, you know, the biking scene for me. I'm, I'm like, I'm hooked. And when that happened, I, I really moved to Miami. And that's when that, we had that moment of the network and saying no to the network. Yeah. So that must, that must've been hard, right? It's always scary, man. It's, it's a, uh, yeah, it's like, what am I doing? You know, like I've never had more responsibilities in my life and now I'm, I'm making this decision towards something that I don't know, but life has its ways. Right. And big risk, big reward doesn't, yeah. doesn't always work out, but when it does, it's pretty cool. And now at the time you had just one child or did you have a second one on the way? No, I had one child. We were living in Miami. I was biking with Ed Bronson, you know, a lot. During that time, I also uh, did my first uh, enduro race. Uh, we went to, uh, to a Trestle bike park in Colorado. So I had a, a you yeah. know, the first taste at an EWS. Uh, and then I really, really, really realized I had no idea what, what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then something cool happened. And then you know, I got my first Hollywood movie that was the 33 with uh, Juliette Binoche and Antonio Banderas. And, um, and after that, I got Narcos. And then Narcos mm. became a big, you know, door opener. It's funny because it never, Narcos was never like, oh my God, this is the guy from Narcos, let's hire him. But people got really curious when my managers, when my manager at that time told people like, hey, I would like you to meet, you know, the guy from Narcos, blah, blah, blah. And they were like, okay, but do we need a translator? And my manager was like, no, the guy speaks perfect English. And they were like, that guy speaks English? No way. You have to, you have to think about, you know, like times have evolved quickly, right? But for producers, you know, it's hard to, to not put you in a box. So that kind of changed the whole scenery because that got me into bigger rooms. And I could meet other casting directors and producers and kind of start getting started getting a shot at it at really, really working in different kind of projects. Yeah, you have you have a unique advantage in the industry um, because you're bilingual, right? Yeah, Dave, but that it has played against me too. Because of the typecasting? I've played a, a huge variety of roles. I like to transform myself also in these roles, but when producers and casting directors read Juan Pablo Raba, they are expecting a specific type of human being. Right. So when I, when I got into the room, especially pre-pandemic, right, that castings were still, you know, face-to-face, -face, I would get into rooms and they would, you know, okay, okay, nice to meet you, do the scene. And I would finish the scene and they would look at me and say like, okay, now can you do this in your natural accent? I'm like, well, this is my natural accent. <laughs> and, you know, they, they started getting like really confused. I'm like, but why? I'm like, well, because this is the way I learned how to speak English. Now, if you need an accent, you want me to talk and do like this. Is This is what you're looking for. Then I can also do that if you want, right? Yeah, 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 that's great. So, I mean, I I can't complain. I've been doing this for a living for a while now. But it's it's funny that I used to think that it was going to be a huge advantage. And it has been on a personal side. I couldn't say so much on the professional side. And I'm going to say on the personal side, because then I have created, you know, with my wife, a great network of amazing friends and relationships where this has really helped a lot. Because... Right. The understanding of the American culture, the, the, you know, the accent or whatever it is, it makes it easier for us to just bond and communicate. JP, what, um, what would you say, so we'll talk about challenges or obstacles in your life. Um, you shared a ton of them, you know, in your younger years, but what would you say is, is one of the current hurdles or obstacles that you might be facing? 
I would say that parenthood, parenthood and marriage is, is a, I don't, I don't, I, I'm going to rephrase it. I don't, I wouldn't say it's a, it's an obstacle. It's a bunch of small obstacles every day. It, there are so many challenges. It's so challenging. It's amazing because every time, you know, you overcome one of those barriers, problems, challenges with your kids, with your, with your, with your spouse, things get better. But it does does not stop. And you're yeah. just every night at some point at 3 a.m. You just wake up and you're like, what now? <laughs> the funny thing is also, I mean, I'm at I'm I'm that age, I guess you are too, that you also realize that everybody's going through the same shit. Doesn't matter if you're super rich, if you're super famous, if you're not. I have come to narrow it down to health, money, and love. You know, and at some point in life, some of those three things is not going to be in an ideal place. You're right. always going to work your ass towards trying to, you know, have that communion, that balance, right? But I would say that, yeah, it's just, it's just the life. It's just, you know, your kid goes to school and he comes back and he's not looking that happy. And you're like, hmm, so what happened today, Right. Yeah. And you wake up and, you know, and for a week, you're not having a great relationship with your spouse. And like, okay, how am I going to fix this? You know, what, what, what are we going to do about this? Right. And you're, and you're constantly just trying to be, and, and, and in between that, I call it, I call it, you know, the juggler paradigm. And it's that you grow up and you just, they hand you, you know, just a ball and you're just, you know, easily handing a ball. And then they hand you two and you're like, okay, I can do this three. And you're like, I'll learn this. Suddenly you're 40 something and you're like 50 balls in the air. Oh, yeah. How do I stop? Right? You just become this juggler and they keep on throwing things to you. And as you grow, it's painful and it applies for everything. It's like, oh, you made a million bucks. <laughs> now you have to pay taxes for the million bucks, bro. <laughs> Life is hard, right? And then you add marriage to it or a relationship to it, it gets harder. And then you add kids to it, it gets harder. And you add a career to it, it gets harder. It's complicated. It is, man. It's complicated. That's that's the beauty of it too. But for example, right now, one of my goals, I don't know if you experienced it, but it hit me hard. I really want to talk about, I want us men to talk about the midlife crisis. I want to talk about men's mental health. It's hard, man. And as a man, society tells you that you have to deal with everything and that it's up to you and you have to wake up and you have to be tough and you have to grind and you have to take care of shit, you know, and it's up to you. And it can get very overwhelming, especially if you feel that you don't have anybody to talk to about, about all this. Yeah, yeah. So that's it. It hit me when I was 42 when my when my second daughter when my daughter was born. I was like, what did I do? This is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life, but am I crazy? What I mean, I'm gonna be 60 something when this human being is 20. How the hell am I gonna put it through college? And it hit me hard. And it's taken me, it's taken me, and it's not a couple months. It takes you a couple of years. I can say right now that I'm in a I'm in a good place, but I've spent a couple hard hard years. And I yeah. can tell you that if it weren't because I have a great spouse and because of bikes, I I don't know. I don't know if I would have had the same outcome right now. JP, you talk about some really interesting things there and and you know, just the challenges of life in general and and you talk about men's mental health. Where what's your position on the importance of men having more men friends in their lives. It's crucial, man. But it's not about how many men friends do you have. It's about, do you have one friend that you can talk to? Some of my best conversations about this, I've just had, I met an amazing friend, dude, and we've only been friends like for two years with Casey Dean. I've had the, the deepest, most amazing conversations about manhood about being an adult, you know, and even though he's not a parent, about parenthood, I've probably had with anybody any time in my life. You really have to make it a point to identify 
that person, those two persons that you can talk to about deep, important shit. You know, you have to have someone that you can talk about your problems or when you're hurting because you, because it's, it's 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 crucial. I know one of the other things you're passionate about is just general human and animal rights. Can you tell me a little bit about, you know, that and, you know, why why you and your wife are, you know, passionate about those categories and what are some of the things that you do in those areas? My my wife grew up in a house of environmentalists. Um her father is um he's a science guy. He's always been into environment. So Monica really, really knows and understands everything that has to do with environment. And she is a, she's an advocate and fighter for it. Um, I myself, uh, it's more in a practical way. I've always, you know, been around dogs and, and animals have been an important part of my life. And it's, it's, it's about, it's about not, not human rights. For us, it's about, you know, life being right. It's about common sense. It's just about in this world that just seems to be sometimes so derailed and so crazy and so much information. It's like feels that we just need to kind of get back into center. And 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 in comes, you know, the mental health, talking about uh, the gender equality talks. It's about, when you think about it, it's just about, okay, how can we just protect, you know, living forms in this planet that for so long now we seem to not care about? So it just becomes right. not one thing. It starts becoming, you know, a part of, 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 a, of a bigger picture. And, and Monica, my wife, she's great at that. Okay. It's like, you cannot talk about this if you don't really, really know a little bit more about the global issues about, you know, that, that are really affecting this. So, you know, we try to just be as, you know, senseful, like just have common sense. It's about that. It's not about schooling anyone. You know, there's too much people like trying to school you and you should do, be doing that. Like, whoa, you know, step by step, what can you do in your own household just to make this a better place? What can you do to be more respectful to others? How can you make people's life around you better? How can you be more fair? How can you, you know, you can you bring more quality into the picture? Um, and I think it's that because sometimes there's just so much information out there that you think, you know, that you have to do something huge, you know, to make a difference. And what we have noticed is that it's the little things. Those little things, you know, take people a long, long way. Are there organizations or is there an organization that you guys are super passionate about that you either give your time or otherwise to? Yeah, we work uh, with this organization here. It's called La Juanfe. And what La Juanfe does, um, it's very specific, right? And it's about empowering girls, young girls that become pregnant without, most times without their consent. So this foundation is like a big school just to prepare them for life, right? It's, it's basically a way to fight poverty in a very poor place yeah. of the country that's Cartagena, that is very lush on, 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 one side of, of you know the story and then you you also realize how poor it is so that is let's say the one organization that we are both ambassadors with um but we have also worked with un you know we've been ambassadors with uh with the un um i have in my, my side for women's rights and gender equality so we are working towards towards you know many things so to speak uh but the main one is Juanfe right now Thank you so much for doing that and and sharing that. Um, we'll we'll definitely add some links on the show so people can learn more about those organizations. Awesome, JP. Let's get back to bikes just a little bit before we wrap the show. Yeah, you know your passion for cycling and and such has caught the attention of a few people in the industry, and you've been able to establish some really cool networks. You know, I'm thinking about you know Crank Brothers and YT and even SRAM, right? <laughs> How did you how did you manage to sort of get on the inside of our little bubble of a industry and establish these relationships? I just think people started getting really excited to think that the guy from Narcos was also riding bikes. That's yeah. that was I think that that was the main door. But then 
But then it became, it became very important for me. And the reason it became very important for me is that in the quest of becoming the best version of me, nothing has made a bigger difference than biking. Biking has become my zen, my health, my distress, my way of challenging myself permanently. It humbles me, it levels me, it makes me want to be better, but it also shows me a lot about respect and finding your own limits. And the most important part is that in a job like mine where you get rejected 99% of the time, you need to have some kind of outlet. And I discover in biking something that I enjoy more than acting. Because one of the problems that we have in this industry is that we have very passionate jobs. You know, it's amazing. You meet stars and you work with Liam Neeson, right? And so what happens when you're not doing that? What happens when you go and you audition for a film by David Fincher and you've always wanted to work with him and you get rejected or you just, or you get up to the top and they say like, sorry, buddy, they went with the other guy. If you don't have something that you really like and you can enjoy, you're in for a hard time. So that's what it is. I discovered something that I enjoy more than acting. And I really started putting time into it. And I really, really started to make it, make an effort in knowing the people in the industry because I wanted to become part of the industry. You know, it's not about, yeah. it's not about getting free stuff, which is great, you know, because I have two kids. It helps. <laughs> it's amazing, right? It's about belonging to something that you really are passionate about because I want to get that message out there. And the message for me is if I can do it, you can do it. Yeah. If I can get over that hump, if I can do that rock garden, if I can, you know, make that gap, clear that gap, you can do it too. If I can have so much fun on a bike, you can do it too. Because let's be honest, you know, like, I would love to shred like the pros, but that's only like 1% of the guys out there. And most of the, <laughs> most of the guys ride like us, you know, they just want to be safe and have fun and be as fast as possible. So I think I am that ambassador. I call myself the, a little bit above the average ambassador. I speak for all those riders, right? I speak for the guy that's yeah. a little overweight, but still gets on the bike and makes a huge effort to get up there, you know, and then just tries to improve, right? Because if you're naturally talented, like, that's great, man. Kudos, buddy. That's amazing. But I speak to all those, for all those, you know, that, you know, are still, you know, they try hard, you know, to just improve every day. Now, Juan, you're you're calling from Colombia today. Yeah. And uh, when, when you and I last spoke, I think you were at Marcelo Gutierrez's yeah. place. Have Have you been riding with him? I have not been riding because he got hurt pretty bad. He had a crash and he got, uh -huh. it was on a gravel bike. He was doing like a, one of these like long ass races and he fell and he hurt, he got hurt pretty bad. He's, he's perfectly, he's not perfectly, but he's on the bike now. Uh, we haven't yeah. been doing any more of our videos, but we have a very cool dynamic going on with a little kind of how to videos where he shows me the way it's done, tries to show me and I just try to follow him and improve. Uh, but we've become really good friends, you know, over the years. Uh, JP, we've got one more section. We're almost out of time, but this last section of ours is the speed round where I throw 15 this or that's at you and you just tell us what you prefer, okay? Get it. All right. Pancakes or waffles? Waffles. Coffee or tea? Uh, neither, but I'll say tea. All right. Tacos or burritos? Tacos. Back to coffee or tea, do you not do caffeine? No, I stopped doing caffeine. Nice, nice. I don't do it either. I drink chocolate now. I drink uh, cocoa. All right. Spicy or mild? Mild. Cold weather or hot weather? Cold weather. Rain or snow? Ooh, that's a tough one. I'll go with snow. The mountains or the beach? The mountains. Cities or suburbs? Suburbs. Cars or trucks? Trucks. Pavement or dirt? Dirt. Gloves or gloveless? Gloves. Definitely. Clipped in or flat pedals? Clipped in. I have no clue how to ride it without on flat. <laughs> Low pressure or high pressure in your tires? Low pressure. Fix it yourself or take it to a mechanic? Fix it yourself. 
Dogs or cats? Both, but I'll go with both. right now cats because that's what I have now. I saw I saw a cat earlier. Do you also have a dog though? I so we're living in an apartment uh, building here, so we don't have a dog at the moment. We but we we know what we do. We it's funny we we adopt get dogs from the street. Yeah. So we take them, we foster them, we put them in good shape, and then we find a home for them. Oh, We've nice. done this a couple of times, and you know, we try to do it as much as possible. And we did this uh, a couple of weeks ago. We found an amazing dog in the street. She just came by, and we had her with us <laughs> for like three weeks. And now she has a great home. So cool. Yeah. Juan Pablo Raba, it has been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for sharing your story, for hanging out with us, and just being a great human. Oh man, I'm a, I don't know. I don't know about that, but uh, we'll definitely work towards that every single day. All right, man. Thanks so much. Thank you, brother.